7. Responsibility An important aspect of biblical law is its doctrine of responsibility. In a law previously considered, Exodus chapter 21, verses 28 to 32, it was established that animals are responsible for their actions, and an ox goring a person was sentenced to death. Animals are clearly held to be accountable. But responsibility also rests with the owner of the ox. If the ox's previous behaviour indicated that it was a dangerous animal and the owner hath not kept him in, then the owner is also responsible. Responsibility is thus not a one-way street. Both owner and animal have a responsibility. This being case law, the reference is to the ox and to more than an ox, as St. Paul made clear with respect to the law concerning the muzzling of an ox treading out grain. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 9, 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 18. In terms of this, certain observations can be made. First, a parent is responsible for a child if nothing is done to curb, punish, or bring to judgment an irresponsible or delinquent child. If a man is responsible for the actions of an ox, he is certainly responsible for the actions of a delinquent son. If he hath not kept him, if no attempt has been made to prevent the son from giving vent to his delinquency. Second, the responsibility of the parent does not absolve the child of his responsibility. The goring ox is always guilty. The owner is only guilty if his negligence can be proven. The prior responsibility is always that of the acting party. The owner or parents can be an accessory to the crime only if he has been delinquent in his responsibility. Third, transgression beyond a certain point ends responsibility. Thus, in the law of the delinquent son, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 to 21, the parent's responsibility to provide for and protect their son ended with the son's delinquency. Their duty and their moral responsibility then became denunciation of and separation from their son. As previously noted, responsibility is not a one-way street. The responsibility of parents for a child ends when that child refuses to submit to the godly authority and discipline of the parents. The same is true of the responsibility of children for their parents. Again, it is not a one-way street. To cite illustrations which will throw some light on this problem, a daughter assumed responsibility for her sick father when the brothers rejected their responsibility. As a devout Christian, she felt duty-bound to care for her father, who remained in her home as an invalid until death. During the more than ten years in her home, the father was a bad patient much of the time. Because he was only interested in the sons and grandsons who would carry on his name, he treated his daughter and her family as non-entities, or at best servants, with never a word of gratitude. He made out his will in favour of his sons and their sons, although his sons were both prosperous. He gave lavish gifts at holidays to his sons and their sons, and never a gift nor a thanks to his daughter and her family. Clearly, the daughter's interpretation of the law was faulty. As surely as an ungodly son must be cast out and turned over for judgment, so an ungodly father, for his conduct revealed him to be such, had no place in her home, having denied plainly any responsibility to it. Another illustration. A mother, 
a militant liberal or modernist in religion, made her home with her daughter and son-in-law, both devout Orthodox believers. The mother regarded the family's faith, church and family worship with contempt, but little did to her grandchildren and daily ridiculed her daughter for her ignorant, reactionary faith. Having denied openly the authority of her son-in-law and having denied the faith of the family, she had forfeited any right to its care and protection. The family's patient suffering was not godly. Because responsibility is a two-way street, the mother had the duty to respect the family's faith, her son-in-law's authority, and her daughter's devotion. Other illustrations can be added. A daughter was expected by her parents to remain unmarried and to care for them. Lacking friends because of their bad character, they demanded that she include them in all her social activities. The results was that the girl lost all her friends because of her parents. From start to finish, the relationship was lawless and the daughter's sense of responsibility was misguided. Another instance. A mother felt duty-bound to use her meagre funds to help her only child, an ungrateful man whose income was good and whose sense of responsibility was very bad. The mother limited herself severely to provide him the luxuries he demanded as necessary to maintain a pretended social position. Again, the relationship was lawless on both sides and required breaking. An Ann Landers column gives the letter of a girl reporting on a family problem. A 20-year-old paralyzed brother in a wheelchair, angry at life for his condition, treats his parents and sisters with hateful contempt and rage. The family, sick at heart, dances to his whims. No one, sick or healthy, has any right to behave so without judgment. Many paralysed people have trained themselves into useful work. This youth has no right to eat food he does not deserve and is ungrateful for. Thus, we may say that not only does transgression beyond a certain point end responsibility, but fourth, if responsibility is maintained beyond that point, it becomes a robbery. Where a juvenile delinquent is tolerated or protected, or a lawless parent allowed to be an affront to the family's faith and authority, the other members of the family are robbed of their due. Unconditional honour and service are due to God alone, not to man. St. Paul's admonition is, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Romans chapter 13 verse 7 No relationship between man and man can be absolutized. We have no absolute bond which ties us unconditionally to any man, either to obey or to love him. Marriage is dissolved by certain transgressions. The parent's duty to the child is nullified by his incorrigible conduct. The child's duty to the parent is limited by his prior obedience to God and the maintenance of God's law order. In every human relationship, the only absolute is God's law, not man's relationship. Fifth. Not only does the absolutizing of a human relationship involve theft, in that the indulgence of a delinquent family or society member is the robbing of another, but it also involves theft Godward as well as manward. It is an infraction of God's order to indulge evil. It involves robbing one person of his due in order to reward or indulge another. And this means also the violation of God's order to continue man's disorder. 
To repeat again, responsibility is not a one-way street. If the ox, an animal of limited intelligence, is accountable for his acts, then every man in his station is also responsible. In every relationship there is responsibility on every side, by every person. Modern man is hostile to responsibility. He replaces responsibility with sensitivity. Sensitivity being defined as awareness of humanity. Thus, a rebellious nun of the Immaculate Heart of Mary sisters defies authority and declares, These men, church officials, have no right to make a judgment when they don't know us. This nun had entered an order requiring authority, but had refused to submit to it. Her freedom to leave and establish her own way of life was not in question. She denied the principle of any responsibility beyond that which she owed to herself. Similarly, an actor, Steve McQueen, complained about the views of Midwestern farmers, adding, When they understand that black people make love, and they make it good, then we'll be on our way. We've got to learn to live together. For McQueen, the fact of being human, of belonging to a species, is the only criterion for judgment. Responsibility, morality have nothing to do with man. It is the Midwestern farmer's moral perspective and insistence on responsibility which McQueen condemns. For such a man there is no meaning to life, hence no moral criterion can be applied to it. Asked about his future, McQueen said, with a shrug, that I'll make mistakes. The main thing, then he stopped, sharp, and shook his head. No, there is no main thing. In a world of brute factuality, all facts are equally important and equally meaningless, and there can be no main thing. It is a world, therefore, without responsibility. But a world without responsibility is a world of the dead.